Hello everyone and welcome to the Skype show episode 7. I am joined today in this episode by Stally Hansen and Anthony Carrigal. As you know, I try my best to make these shows live for you and I've had some technical glitches in some episodes while others have aired without my problems. However, in episode 7 I have some human glitches, namely myself, and this means that I have to break my own rule and air this show as pre-recorded instead of live. I apologise for this and in episode 8 the show will be back to normal. In this show, we have for you part two of Enterprise Voice, the series that we started back in episode six. And if you missed that episode, you can watch it anytime on the Skype Show website. Stanley Hansen will be with us in session two. And he is a well-known and globally respected Office Services and Services MVP. And he will be delivering a presentation on Skype, Skype for Business called Quality Methodology. Anthony Carrigal, who is also well known and respected globally, Office Services and Service is MVP. He will be joining us later to deliver a session on Enhanced 911. And some of you may remember Anthony appeared on the very first episode back in January. Sadly, as this is a pre recorded session, there will be no questions and answers at the time at the end of this broadcast. However, if you do have any questions about the content from any of our presenters, then please reach out via email or Twitter or via our respective blogs. So moving on to the sessions. Session one, Enterprise Voice Part Two. First of all, a bit of a recap if you missed the last episode. So Enterprise Voice is a huge topic that we can simply just cannot condense into a single 20 minute session. And therefore, I'm designing a mini series of 20 minute snippets within these episodes that will scratch the surface of Enterprise Voice and hopefully clear up any of the initial confusions around the topic. Back in episode six, I started with the basics of call authorization and discussed the, the use of dial plans and their effect on not only outbound calls, but also inbound as well. I also touched on normalization rules and their importance to, in order to um, correctly formulate a line URI with a basic introduction to regular expressions. I also described the basic routing logic Skype for Business Server uses to route an inbound and outbound call from the user to gateway and vice versa. In this episode, I'm going to talk about voice policies, what they are and why we need them, as well as PS10 usages and voice routes and how we can determine the best and correct route for PS10 calling. So firstly, voice policies. These are like group policies of enterprise voice for users, if you like. They control the voice features available to users and also what calling rights the users have. Voice policies can be assigned at three levels, the global, the site or the user level. Like in the dial plan assignment, a user-based voice policy must be assigned to a user or users in order to take effect. If it is, then this policy is the effective policy the user receives. During a DR scenario, as this is a user policy, it follows the user and this will be effective regardless of which call the user is registered to. If, the, if a user policy is not assigned to a user specifically and there is a site policy, then the site policy is the effective policy. The site policy relates to the topology site in the Skype for Business topology and is decided based on the user's registrar pool um, homing in relation to this site. Uses of a site policy over user policy means that you can assign a default level of features and access to all users located on the same registrar pool. For example, this is a particularly useful in cases where you want to allow non-enterprise enabled users the same within the same site to dial out using um, within PSTN conferences using specific SIP trunks and caller IDs, but you don't want them to have a full enterprise voice calling features and you want to ease the level of administration burden on your staff. So one consideration for site-based voice policy is that it's assigned to a site. So if you have a DR registrar pool paired with this, this active site located within another site, in the topology, then during failover, the site policy will not fail over with the users. Here you would need to create a duplicate site policy in the DR site or create a new site policy that routes the call out of different gateways at the DR site if this, this proves um, least cost or complies to your DR policy. However, if 
neither a user or site policy exists. The global voice policy takes effect. As a result, the best practice approach for creating voice policies is to create a least to most privileged model. A global voice policy should include the least amount of privilege you want to give all your users across the, the world when enabled for enterprise voice. And sometimes this is nothing at all. Then the site policy can be used to set standard access to users registered within that pool within the same site, such as dialogue conferencing for non-enterprise voice enabled users. This then the user policy should be used for full enterprise voice users to provide full access to calling features and routes. Like I said, in voice policies, voice policies have calling features. These features enable or disable the level of call control available to users who are assigned the policy. So in Skype for Business, there are several call features available, so such as call forwarding, delegate ring, call transfer, call park, team calling, etc. And some of these features are self-explanatory. So I'm not going to spend much time or if any on time on them, but others require some further understanding. So let's take a brief look at PSTM reroutes. So what is it? This is an internal calling feature whereby users enabled for enterprise voice can leverage their access to the PSTN to call fellow colleagues within another site via the PSTN in the event of network congestion. So as you're probably thinking, this, feature, this is a feature layer on top of call admission control. Taking an example in the slide, Anthony's home at a remote site that has its own PSTN access via an SBA appliance. There is a call admission control policy governing the use of the corporate one link. So when Anthony attempts to call Mark at the HQ site using peer-to-peer -peer Skype for business call, call admission control will allow this because it's determined that there's insufficient bandwidth available on the one link to process the call. Therefore, with PSTN reroute enabled, Skype for Business will attempt to call Mark using his DDI over the PSTN and egressing out of the Skype for Business uh, out of the branch SBC and back in via the HQ SBC through to Mark. So obviously this has a few dependencies and mainly that both users have to have DDIs assigned to them and these DDIs need to terminate to the correct SBCs, so for HQ for the Mark, branch for Anthony, and they must both have the correct voice policies assigned with the supportable routes. So malicious call trace is another feature available to users. So when this is enabled, if a user receives a call that they determine as a nuisance, so a prolonged sales call, cold calling, etc., they can report this immediately after the call using the report a call button in the Skype for Business Client Tools menu. What this does is sends a SIP message to the front end server marking the previous call as malicious. As you can see by the trace, the error report sends a SIP 488 response code to the front end containing the diagnostic message call identified as malicious by the user. The key number here to remember is the diagnostics event error code 51017. And this is used by administrators to trace the call. To malicious, the malicious call is then recorded in the Skype for Business CDR database. And as you can imagine, this has a dependency on monitoring and reporting being deployed and enabled on not only the topology, but enabled for the user as well. Otherwise, there will be no record of the call. Using the top failure CDR report, admins can search for diagnostic code 51017 to identify how many call malicious calls have been made, uh, have been marked by the users. They can then dive into that report to determine the user who reported a call, the date, the time, and the caller ID of the, of the person who called. So while malicious call trace does not on its own prevent the caller from calling again, it does provide the ability to flag these to administrators. You can then best decide on how to manage the situation, whether that is to contact the IST, IST, ITSP to block the caller ID, routing the call based on caller ID to a black hole using SBC, or adding it to an internal call blocking service that you may have. Moving on to PS10 usages. These are critically important and the fundamental basis of foot call routing. PSTN usages are containers, so you can imagine them like as security groups. PSTN uses, usages contain voice routes that act as a kind of an access control list for call routing. These can be used to provide users a varied level of access to the PSTN. 
from restricting users to emergency calling only, all the way through to all you could eat, do what you want, PSTN access. PSTN usages are designed, are assigned, sorry, to voice policies in the main, but are also used in other areas of enterprise voice, such as network sites for location-based routing and enhanced 911 to route to emergency calls to the appropriate emergency gateway. As you can see from the picture, you can order the PSTN usages. Usages that are, tri are attempted from top to bottom in the list. So if the first PSTN usage has a valid route, this is used to route the call. This is important because more than one PSTN usage can contain a valid route for the call. So imagine you have a UK gateway that accepts calls st um, starting with plus four four. So for users from the UK, you'd want them to route to the PSTN any UK national number via this gateway. But now imagine you have an, a gateway, uh, let's say in France, that also accepts plus 44 along with the, the French national code. So why would you have a French gateway accepting a, a route for for the UK? So this is a, you can have this for a number of reasons. So the users within uh, France, they can use this gateway to call uh, the UK numbers over the international PSTN. But more simply is that you could have this route as a failover route in the event of the UK route being un unavailable. So UK calls in this event would be attempted to through the UK gateway. If the gateway was down, it would then fail over to the French gateway and the call would process over the PSTN that way. The importance of prioritizing your PSTN usages correctly uh, is paramount to, to your billing from, from your ITSP. So imagine the PSTN usage for the French gateway was a higher priority than the PSTN usage for the UK um, gateway in the voice policy assigned to UK users. The call would still progress and it would still work, but the problem will arise when your finance department receives a telephone bill and you'll find that all these calls have been charged at international rate. Associating routes with usages. So voice routes are like I said, associated with PSTN usages. You cannot directly associate a voice policy or user with a voice route. It must go via a PSTN usage. The associated route list contains all the valid routes the PSTN usage can try before returning a failure and the next usage is attempted. Call forwarding and simultaneous ringing can be controlled by their own routes and controls. Setting the usage to internal users only means that only means that forward and simultaneous ring destinations can only be internal Skype for business users, therefore effectively present, preventing PSTN endpoints such as mobile phones and landlines being valid destinations for these, these features. Following the voice policy usages means that these will be handled in the same manner as a normal call is made from the user. And while custom usages, you can define specific routes and gateways that these, these features must, feature calls must take. Custom PSTN usages for forward and simultaneous ring scenarios are useful in scenarios whereby you don't want these to consume capacity on your main SIP trunks, or you want to restrict the type of endpoint that can be used as a forward or simultaneous ring destination. So for example, if you want to restrict a forward destination or simultaneous destination ring destination to UK landlines only, you can assign a PSTN usage policy to these features that effectively block um, calls to an international or mobile numbers for these types of calls. Moving on to routes. So routes are configured by matching a normalized pattern. And this is usually the first three or four digits of the call number and associating it with a gateway or gateways. Here, here you also have the option to suppress your caller ID. So if you want users caller ID to be presented as to the call party as your office mainline number, here is where you can enter that information. When adding a PSTN gateway, it is important to remember that this is not failover routing. When you add more than one gateway to, to the gateway list, this tells the route it can use any of the gateways listed 
to process the call. So you have no control over which gateway the call will egress out of into the PSTN. Like PSTN usages in voice policies, the voice routes can also be ordered in the priority. And this is used to govern the routes as used in a PSTN usage where more than one route is a valid route. For example, configuring a location policy for E911, it will be assigned a PSTN usage. You would want the emergency call to go via priority route or primary route, yeah, for example, your emergency gateway. But what happens if fire is burnt through a connecting cable or has destroyed that gateway? Without an alternative route, the call will fail and potentially could cost lives. So you can add another route that will use a normal gateway perhaps in another building and another site to act as a failover. In this event, you have a single PS10 usage, let's say it's called HQ emergency that has two routes associated, one to your emergency gateway and another to a backup gateway. Without route ordering, potentially the normal gateway route could have a higher priority in the voice route priority table than the emergency gateway. So when the emergency number is called, the normal gateway is always used to process the call instead of the emergency gateway. And so in effect, the emergency gateway is the failover route. And therefore it's important to pay attention to your voice route priorities. Some configurations, these are used to define the connections and supportability that allow Skype for Business to interoperate with your SPCs. Here, the trunk can support many different settings, including secure real-time protocol, SRTP, fast failovers, and media bypass settings, etc. Most of the settings here will be custom to your integration with your chosen SBC and protocols, and you should consult your integration manuals for the required settings that you need. For some interoperability, you may have to use PowerShell to create or modify the configurations as the UI does not have all the settings available. One to note on the trunk configuration is that it allows you to transform calling and called number numbers to interoperate with not only your SBC, but also the PSTM network and ITSP. So for example, a German gateway can be used for least cost routing by UK users. However, their caller ID will be a UK number starting with plus four four. The German ITSP will most likely refuse calls placed over their network with this ID as it, they cannot prove ownership of a UK number. So we can use calling number translations to replace the caller ID with a German mainline office number or even an auto attendant service dedicated for Germany. This is also useful for removing the extension part of the line UI of users um, caller ID. So some ITSPs may not strip this for you and therefore numbers are presented incorrectly to the call party. So it's best practice to remove the extension element from the line URI at the trunk level. Also PSTN standards in some countries state that the number should be presented with a zero instead of the E164 format. Therefore we can use the called number translation rules to remove the plus based on the called number and add a zero. Some of this configuration, of course, can be done at SBC level. And I see many deployments where this is the case. However, I like to keep the most, if not all of the manipulations and translations within Skype for Business itself and configure the SBCs as a simple pass-through device between the PSTN and Skype for Business, bringing all the voice routes, routing configuration, number normalizations to Skype for Business without, um, instead of splitting it over SBC and Skype for Business. I find it simplifies troubleshooting. It also speeds up any change management that you may have. So trunk translations in practice. So here we have an example of a trunk translation. On the left example, we have a UK caller calling a German landline. So here you can see that UK users caught caller ID has been replaced with a German number so that the call will progress. On the right, we see that Anthony, who is in Germany with an E164 German number and the, the called number translation rules transforms it into a localized number 
starting with the zero makes it without the plus 49. This concludes this session and I hope you've enjoyed it and it was useful for you. I now have the pleasure of introducing our first special guest, Stally Hansen. Welcome, Stally. So, um, thank you, Mark. I'm going to talk about uh, getting started with the call quality methodology. And uh, it's an important topic. And this session is about understanding the basics, why you need to do it. And then uh, I will give you some pointers where to start and, uh, and to my blog post that uh, tells you where you can download the different tools. My name is uh, Stola Hansen. I'm a Scarfer Business MVP or Office Servers and Services MVP. And I'm also the CEO of Advania in, in Norway. I've been working with this for the past 10 years. And the call quality methodology is something that's really, it, it's a good set of tools or a good mindset when working with voice quality with Sky for Business because it looks at the date in a different way than just looking at the quality, looking at the monitoring reports. So it's actually real, actual, uh, actionable content. So but let me start with the story uh, of the end user experience because it takes uh, the vantage point of an end user and how the end user experiences a call with Sky for Business and look at, looks at quality that way. And uh, before I go any further, this methodology is created by Microsoft. So that's this is something that Microsoft uh, internally use as well. And uh, they had some sessions uh, on this, uh, both at uh, TechEd, at Ignite. And uh, it is a really good way to work with the quality, especially from administrator, but you also can use this tool as a, um, as a consultant in order to, um, uh, uh, as a first touch with a customer and look at how their solution is performing. So from the end user um, um, perspective, uh, you have the user um, going into work uh, and uh, you have like, uh, the office where the user uh, is home or you have the central office or remote offices. And the thing is that users, they expect good quality as long as they are at the office. Uh, regardless of wired and wireless and what kind of computer they have, they expect that the quality is taken care of. It, uh, you have IP telephony, it's, uh, it has always worked and they expect the same thing with Skype and Skype for Business. So they have their computer, they have their headset, and already you have some factors uh, that uh, will affect quality. It could be the computer, it could be overloaded, it could have a faulty client, it could uh, uh, be something wrong with the drivers, the hardware, the firmware, the BIOS, whatnot. And then you have the headset, uh, and the question is if it's wired, wireless, uh, if, um, if it's old or new and uh, preferably it should be USB based and of course uh, optimized for Skype for Business and Link. And then uh, the user uh, wants to join a meeting uh, on the Skype for Business server and then you have the carrier between the client and the server and um, now you already have, let me tell, let me count, it's like one, two, three, four, five factors affecting voice quality just in the first call. Because you have the server and the performance on the server, and then you have the network between the client and the server that affects voice quality. And then if this is a voice call going out to the PSDN network, uh, it will also go through the mediation server. But first, let's look at some other uh, devices as well. Uh, you, because you have your uh, um, iPad or uh, other uh, pads, and then you have mobile devices, and they may go through wireless. So then you have a different carrier as well. So even to the first server, you have different paths. And uh, some of them always works, like the wired network, but then you have the wireless network, and the end user expects good quality there as well. And uh, if you go through the mediation server, you still you have another core component 
that may affect voice quality. And you have the network between the front end server or the Sky for Business server and the mediation server that also needs to be good and can affect voice quality. And then of course you have the voice gateway, either it is uh, honed uh, at the office or in the data center, or if it's remote with direct SIP tracking to the, uh, uh, to the operator. And you have the network between there as well. So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 factors affecting voice quality only in this one call. And this is a, a really difficult uh, topic to, to troubleshoot and, and to work with uh, over a longer time. Uh, so breaking it down into how the end user makes a call is really important. And then you have some other scenarios as well, you, because you also have external users and uh, external users may be connect through VPN. Uh, so they are external, but, but still log in as internal users. Uh, and then uh, you have, of course, through the uh, edge server and, uh, um, and you have the quality at home, you have the internet and all, all the different factors. Uh, affecting this uh, external call as well. The great thing about the call quality methodology is that it breaks quality down into these scenarios. So the first thing, thing we should look at is of course core performance in your data center, because that's where you have full control over the servers and the, the performance. So we shouldn't start troubleshoot anything until we have full control over the core performance. And the last thing you should look at is wireless and uh, external users, because that's something that's the most difficult to, to work with. And, uh, and typically it's known that, that uh, the quality may be affected by those factors. So this, is, this will help you prioritize what you want to focus troubleshooting or improving as well. That's why I love the call quality methodology. So CKM looks at quality in three ways. You have the server performance, the core performance. Then you have the endpoints, looking at uh, how the endpoints are performing and of course the headsets and uh, whatnot. And the last thing you should look at is the network. But network is broken into two parts. You have the network, network between servers, which should be really good. And if you have a performance issue there, then you should fix that. And, and that's something you should have 100% control, control, control over. But uh, uh, the network uh, on the wireless, uh, wired um, against clients or maybe external network, that's something you should look at last. So, and by breaking it down like this, uh, you know that you start inside out when troubleshooting. So, you should start with what you have full control over and then move out in the periphery uh, until you can point to the ISP uh, or the operator and tell them it's your fault. Everything is working perfectly here. So um, for on the server side, the core infrastructure must be healthy. And to do that, we use the key health indicators uh, and look at the thresholds there. So. You shouldn't look at, at anything else until you have look, looked at the performance counters within Sky for Business. The cool thing is that it, there are 8,000 performance counters for Sky for Business, but this, me this methodology breaks it down to 25. The 25 most important um, key health indicators. And you shouldn't troubleshoot anything else before you have done a benchmark, a baseline uh, using the key health indicators because um, you don't know if you have a performance issue on your front-end server or a mediation server. So that could be affecting quality within an uh, MCU or in a conference in, uh, when you do PSDN calling and so on. So this is really important that you look at server health first because that's where you have 100% control over performance. And then you look at the next uh, levels. And this is the network between the AVMCU and the mediation server, the mediation server to the gateway and the gateway to the PSDN. So these are network factors. So you should look at core performance and the network 
at the data center first. Because if you have packet loss within your data center, then you probably have issues, but those issues should be possible to fix. So what we've seen is that if you uh, virtualize your servers, you may not uh, have enough resources to run the servers. The uh, hypervisor hosts may be overcommitted with the servers, or you don't haven't reserved any any um, uh, resources. I actually seen this at the customer where they didn't reserve the resources and it was fine within the proof of concept. But when we went into production, the server didn't perform well. And that's a really difficult thing to troubleshoot because it doesn't get highlighted in the event viewer, it doesn't get highlighted in the zip log, everything looks fine, but it doesn't perform. But the key as indicators will show you that the CPU has a long response time, that the memory isn't working okay, or you have delays on your network card. And, and as, as well, you need to look at the media path between uh, the server roles. Some of them may be collocated or you can use different servers. Uh, so that network should be below 1% packet loss. And then you look at endpoints, you look at devices, uh, average send uh, and listen loss, and uh, we look at system health. And actually this um, system health attribute is something I haven't seen anywhere else, which is called the audio mic glitch rate. Um, we have seen that end users that have a high value on audio mic glitch rate, they tend to have trouble with their computer. Could be either they're, they're running it through RDP protocol and when they shouldn't. Uh, it could be uh, firmware issues, BIOS uh, issues, uh, network driver issues, or just a old computer. It could also be that they have a headset that's getting old and uh, it's not performing very well anymore. Because remember that Sky for Business and Link and Office Communication Server has been around for almost 10 years. So some of these devices actually may be getting old. And I have seen values up to 30,000. So typically when we highlight the 10 uh, users that have the most issue uh, or the highest uh, rating, they are typically uh, typically those who complain the most. So it's a really good way to highlight uh, users that's, uh, that have computers that uh, isn't performing, even though the solution is working perfectly. So my advice is to uh, highlight those users, uh, sit down with them, spend, spend some minutes with them, talk to them. How are you day to day? How, are you, how, 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 how does it feel at work, especially? And uh, can I take a look at your computer? How is it performing? How do you use Sky for Business? It could be that users are using it the wrong way. It could be that they're using the wrong devices. Something is not uh, correct. And uh, what Microsoft has seen is that you may work with this golden configuration with the perfect uh, firmware, the perfect driver version, and, and so on. And that's what gets highlighted in the system health. So. It doesn't see it anywhere else. In terms of media path, you should look at uh, high VPN usage because it's not uh, recommended to run over VPN uh, or if you use a lot of internal relay. If internal relay is unintentionally high, you should look at why uh, traffic is relayed through the ed internal leg on the edge server for internal uh, media and look at how you can open uh, the firewall, so you can do direct connectivity between the clients instead. And lastly, you could look at transport. If it's a high TCP transport, then you should look at the, your uh, UDP range. And on the network side, wired versus wireless. So of course you should look at wired and wireless. And, and this is something you tackle last because the device needs to be performing, the server needs to be performing, and then your wired network should be performing. At last, your wireless should be performing. But that's the last thing you look at and spend uh, time on after you have improved everything else. Because we know that it is an issue with wireless. It is a shared media. It is and probably not designed for real-time communication, typically. Uh, and the wired, you need to look at why um, or if you need quality of service on the network because 
you are competing with streaming from Facebook, you're competing with streaming from YouTube, streaming from from uh, the European Championship uh, for football or uh, the Olympics, whatever. And that's traffic that needs to be down prioritized and you need to always prioritize the voice quality of your Sky for Business solution. But then you need end-to-end -end quality experience and uh, that's another discussion. So how to get started with this? Well, you should start by uh, creating a baseline using key health indicators over 14 days. And so uh, Microsoft has created a script that uh, deploys the key health indicators based on your server role, server version, and so on. So um, they will uh, install the performance counters and you should run them for 14 days in a normal production week. So don't do it uh, during um, summer. You do it uh, when users are back and using the solution in a normal way. And the reason you should do it over 14 days is to capture all the different scenarios. That's when you have a baseline. That's when you, how, how, when you know how it works, uh, when it works, how it looks like when it works. Because then you can use the key health indicators and the performance counters as troubleshooting tool as well, because you, uh, you will know if something has changed. So you have the baseline, either you improve something that needs to be improving, or you can use it as a baseline for how it was when it worked, what's the difference now? And the most often, awesome thing about this, we have two different um, uh, cases where we discovered that the uh, uh, disk wasn't performing. So uh, the SQL servers were using some old sounds and uh, because they were virtualized, we do everything in uh, virtual environments here in Norway. And um, we found out that the disks weren't performing. That's something that's nearly impossible to discover. But the key health indicators, they highlight this. And we also discovered that it was a network card that wasn't performing. It was the wrong uh, drivers, so it wasn't optimal. So the first thing we tried was to move the server to a different host because this, of course, was also virtualized. And then it started working. So then we could pinpoint the host that wasn't performing. And uh, that's priceless, right? To, to actually be able to go to the hypervisor administrator and tell them where their problem are is. And uh, they are happy actually, because they heard that maybe something was going on, but they couldn't find out. So here we go. And then uh, you should capture the quality experience data from the monitoring database. And this is something you can do while you're waiting for these 14 days to pass. And you should do it manually the first time because then you can highlight and, and look at uh, how the VPN, if there is a lot of VPN going on uh, or uh, how long um, uh, it has uh, been running, uh, how the audio may glitch rate, what kind of devices are in use. And if you can find some apparent uh, fault in, in the solution that needs to be fixed right away. So I, I usually, usually do use this um, uh, capturing of the QE data uh, when the first time I uh, uh, start working with a customer that has an ex existing deployment because it tells me so much about the deployment and this is something that should go on. Uh, so check if you have any obvious areas to fix and fix them. And of course you should fix one area at a time but I know you guys, you will fix everything at once. Uh, but please document what you do and so you know what fixed the problem. But, uh, and then you need to do a new baseline, take a new report out and, and see if uh, the fix worked and then create a new prioritized list of fixes to work with. And then you set up a management server. You probably have that from before as well, but uh, we always do this in uh, deployments lately to set up a management server where we install SQL standard edition server, where we can install the call quality dashboard. Because the call quality dashboard is a real-time view of the QE data in the CQM format. So it looks at uh, performance data between server roles, between the AVMCU and the mediation server, the mediation server and the gateway, and the gateway and out. So uh, it will break down the data 
uh, in a way that's actionable still, but it's real time. The reason you need a standard edition SQL Server, or you could do enterprise, and preferably not uh, have it on a production SQL Server, is because uh, the call quality dashboard will download the data and uh, work with it within a SQL cube and then present it to you in a website. So you don't have to do this uh, offline uh, working with um, the QE data, you can do it live. And then you also should install the real-time statistics manager on the same uh, management server where you can install CFI util or whatever. And the real-time statistics manager is also a real-time view of the key health indicators data. Uh, so the thing is about the call quality methodology is that it's something you do during the entire lifetime of your deployment. It's not something you do when you deploy it. It's something you do every month, every quarter to see if anything is changed because the solution changed over time, the user changed how they use the deployment, you introduce new components, new patches, updates, and also new, compo uh, new components and versions of those. So the, the, it changes over time. So it's really important to do this and uh, operationalize. That's, uh, that's how to work with the call quality methodology. So to get started with the call quality methodology, look at uh, server core first then work your uh, way out and uh, to the end users and then look at uh, VPN traffic and external users and then look at your network and how it's performing. I wrote a blog post some time ago, I, I will keep it updated, uh, where you can find the tools I'm talking about. Uh, there is quite a lot of tools actually you can use and of course you need to use your understanding of Sky for Business to actually improve on the quality but that's another topic. So thank you. Thank you Stanley for that excellent session. I am now able to introduce our next guest speaker, Anthony Cargill. Thanks Mark. My name is Anthony Cargill, Office Server and Services MVP. I wanted to talk about uh, emergency services today and what I mean by that is I don't want to go into any kind of deep dive. Uh, you see 101 here. Uh, this is not a 400 level deep dive because uh, what I've seen is a lot of people actually get uh, the how to set it up. There's a lot of blogs around how to set up location services and things of that nature. But what I see actually missing, what I see actually uh, missing from a lot of deployments I've stepped into that have already been performed is, uh, is kind of the higher level stuff. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit, the, the why and, and what needs to be known before we, we start any of this. I'm going to apologize up front. Uh, as you can tell, I'm an American. Uh, and most of this, if not all of it, well, okay, no, I'll take that back. Most of it, but not all of it, is going to be US centric. I'm going to, instead of saying emergency services, I'm going to say 911. Uh, and I may refer to some things that are only available in the US, some services. Um, so if you're not from the US, just watch anyway. It'll be fine. You'll be fine. Um, but sorry. So, what's the big deal? Uh, I mentioned I walk into uh, deployments, uh, maybe done by another consultancy. Uh, I am a, a Skype for Business consultant, or maybe it's done in-house. And, and when I walk in and Linker Skype's already set up, um, or maybe if I'm walking in on a, an old Cisco or, or a BIA deployment, they're not always emergency services compliant. And what I mean by that is, you know, you call 911 uh, if you're in the U.S. and they, you get the wrong address, you get the wrong location, or maybe they don't know anything about you. So before we enter into any kind of agreement with, uh, with either uh, our own company or a company that we're uh, trying to sell this to, we need to make sure that they understand that this is a very big part of any kind of enterprise voice deployment, and we need them to understand why. Um, with that, I kind of walk them through this a little bit, and I have to make sure that they are on the same page here before we agree uh, to start anything. And, and the first reason is it may be the law. It's not the law anywhere. And what I mean by the law is the ability to locate people, the ability for emergency dispatch to see where the person is actually located. It may be the law, uh, wherever you are, uh, where I am in uh, Illinois, we have to locate people within 40,000 square feet, for example. So if you have a 
uh, a very large premises. Uh, maybe you've got multiple floors and you're crossing a few hundred thousand square feet and you've got different branch offices. We have to know where you are in each of those locations. Maybe the law. Uh, that may not sway a customer because there is a cost associated with deploying all this. Uh, or that may not sway your, your business. So um, a lot of times if you, if you don't set it up right and uh, 911 you know, has a problem, you're going to get a fine, but not much else. Uh, so if they're not moved by the fact that they need to set this up because it's the law, uh, you really need to stress that it's, it's not just about that, it's about employee health and safety. Even if you're, they've never had to call for emergency services, uh, one day they likely will, and when they do, you need them to get to, to uh, the person who needs help as quickly as possible. If even that doesn't seem to sway them into to making sure this is deployed properly, um, there is a cost associated with it. Uh, some people want to take the risk, but they have to understand that the risk uh, of not deploying it may be greater. The risk of being sued. For example, I have a client who has a, uh, it's a manufacturer and they've got large warehouses. Uh, I mentioned in Illinois, we're every 40,000 square feet. Well, these facilities are 900,000 square feet each. And we have phones all over the place. We have people um, who can take their laptop and walk to different areas of the facilities. And even though the police are always going to go to the front door, because that's really the only entrance other than some truck loading docks, uh, that doesn't matter because if somebody has a box fall on them and they, uh, we can't locate the exact quadrant of the warehouse they are, the, even, though, even if the police don't care, even if there's not a fine associated with that, if the, the person who was crushed or needed help uh, finds out that you did not provide the location that you're required by law, uh, there could be a big potential lawsuit there, and even so as for, for the company itself, but even for you uh, as the implementer of the solution. So before you enter in any agreements to deploy Enterprise Voice, you need to know the emergency services law, you need to know what your liability is as the implementer, and you need to have written, uh, you need to discuss have, having kind of written accountability lying on the part of the the uh, firm itself, because you have to understand that even if you set it up perfectly, the second you walk out the door, there can be network changes, switches changing, uh, all sorts of things that can just destroy this, blow this whole thing out of the water, and you don't want your name assigned to it, especially if they don't seem to really care about it. So make sure that uh, before you enter into any agreement that the liability is squarely uh, on the customer themselves and have it in writing. Before you have these conversations, maybe it's in a sales, uh, through a sales process, or maybe they're just determining if they want to deploy the solution still. You need to know the law. You need to be able to speak intelligently about this. Uh, if you don't know the law and you're in the US, uh, great resources, Red Skies resource, they are uh, uh, qualified for Skype for Business as a 911 service. Uh, but uh, they make it easy to find it right by any state, and I think the SEO actually pops it up in uh, Google. So I know this is, again, US-centric, sorry about that. Um, but if you need to know what the 911 laws are in the states where the company is located, uh, again, a great resource. But you really need to make sure that you're informed, that you start off uh, making sure you're informed so you're not walking in clueless. You need to then set expectations. When you're walking in, if somebody, maybe they've had Avaya, they've had Skype, they've had, uh, well, maybe not Skype, they've had Avaya or Cisco, and you're walking through the door, uh, or they've had some old legacy equipment, they might have had these emergency locations right down to uh, the desk because it was based on the phone number, because the phone never used to move from a desk. Now people are more mobile than ever. The, their phone is on their smartphone, their phone is on their tablet, their phone is on their laptop, their phone is on whatever PC device they might have. And maybe they have a, a Mac and the, maybe they uh, have a desk phone as well. They're very mobile. They can just pick it up and they can walk down the hall or change buildings or change offices. Uh, and you still need to be able to locate them. And you're not going to be able to do that by phone number. So people need to understand that that the, the more granular you want to locate someone down to the desk level like they might have done in the past or the, the office, uh, there's going to be a lot of additional management around that. And that additional management comes from cable management, for example. So if you locate them right to the, the office, you're going to need to know what ports are in that office. If you know what ports are in that office, uh, you're going to have to map that back to the switch ports. Uh, you're going to have to then map that all the way back to Skype, and, and there's going to be a lot of location information to keep. 
And there has to be a lot of process and rigor around things that you never had to worry about before. Say, you know, you had an intern or somebody in the help desk or the local IT department would flip cables around trying to find a working port. That can no longer happen without a process to make sure that they're not changing 911 locations. Any kind of network change. If the networking team was just used to being able to like, oh, we'll throw up a new VLAN for this or a new subnet for that. Now they also have to involve the Skype team because if somebody can put a laptop there, you need to locate them for 911 services. You can't have uh, areas where you can't locate them for emergency services, typically depending on the law. And beyond that, there's just the whole uh, management process around Skype and making sure that your vendor supports uh, everything that you need to have supported. Who's responsible for updating the location information on the side of the vendor, the telephony provider, and things of that nature. So while it's certainly possible to be as granular as you want, uh, it is not always recommended. Um, and clients are not often, uh, or, or people deploying Skype are not often uh, prepared for the amount of work that's really involved and setting up a massive amount of locations and the process that's going to be required to maintain that going forward throughout the years. Now, if you're in the sales process, you're maybe you're maybe you're in-house and you're trying to convince them to go with Skype uh, and you start talking about this, that may sound like a, a negative mark on Skype for business and you need to make it very clear that it is absolutely not. This is a unified communications challenge, not a Skype challenge. So any telephony platform that lets you take a soft client, run it on a laptop and make phone calls from it and what telephony platform these days doesn't, um, they're going to have the same challenge. They're, they're going to have the same challenge of being able to locate people from a laptop. So your being knowledgeable of this is going to be the advantage to selling this because you know the Skype for Business can handle this quite well, that it has native capabilities around this and there are options around this. And in fact, if another vendor is coming in, maybe you're competing against other vendors or you're competing against other solutions. This is a, a big sales point uh, because a lot of times they'll kind of brush that under the rug. They're the, uh, oh, tell them not to make uh, emergency calls from their laptop. You can't do that. If they have, if, if they have a device that's acting as a phone, they're going to have to be able to make these emergency calls. And you don't want to just tell them not to make emergency calls because that's just not going to cut it. And it may be against the law. If they still want to go to the port level or if that's still a requirement, maybe there's policies that require it or maybe they are uh, an organization where it's critical, maybe a school or something, they, uh, they have to be able to locate 911 to the classroom, for example. Uh, don't assume that you're going to be able to do that natively either. Be aware uh, that options such as set CSLIS switch, set CSLIS port, those require LLDP. What LLDP is, that's Link Layer Discovery Protocol. You have to make sure that, first of all, all the networking hardware supports it, that they're not hanging a Linksys or a Netgear or some cheap uh, unmanaged switch at the end of something that's going to break all that connectivity. So not only do you have to make sure that their, their networking hardware supports it, you have to make sure that their device is supported. So if they're running laptops with Windows 7 in or below, and we see a ton of Windows 7 adoption right now, much more than Windows 10 or Windows 8, uh, you need to also understand that Windows 7 didn't have native LLDP support. So if you want to locate somebody to the room level and they've got Windows 7 deployed, you can either say, uh, we'll need to put a desk phone in that room because the desk phone does support LLDP. Uh, and maybe we're not going to be as granular with a, uh, with the Windows or Mac clients. Uh, or you're going to need a third-party solution. Uh, third-party solutions out there do exist that let you get to the port level even without all the... Uh, uh, the LLDP support of, of the Windows clients. Uh, and the way they accomplish that is typically they'll act as uh, primary, secondary LIS providers for Skype for Business. And they can do SNMP scanning of your switches. So you have to be able to scan your switches. Uh, typically what that'll do is they'll find out the, they'll know the MAC address that's talking on the port. They can create a table of that. They'll have the location assigned to that port. And you can provision it through their tools, which is actually often nicer because they might have a GUI front end versus just straight PowerShell. But they'll let you uh, leverage all that. So when the 911, the emergency call comes through, they can match up the MAC address to that table. Not a perfect solution because, again, if people are quickly or rapidly changing, uh, that information may not converge quickly. And on that point, those locations need to be refreshed. So. Let's, uh, let's take the example somebody has a laptop and they're moving from one location to another. 
uh, but their client doesn't sign back out and back in. In that situation, their location may not be accurate anymore when they reach a new location. Uh, the default location refresh, so if you're just logged in your Skype client, the default for it to check to say, hey, am I still in the right location is once every four hours. Uh, you can take that down to as little as one hour, I think, or as high as 12 hours, and you just do that through the location policy. Um, but if, uh, if that's a concern, that's something you may need to think about, something to discuss, but also know that if your client does sign out and back in, say you unplug an Ethernet cable or uh, you're really changing from, a, you shut your laptop or you're really changing a Wi-Fi hard for whatever reason, uh, it's disconnecting and reconnecting to a different SSID, that uh, when your client logs back in, it will refresh the, uh, the location of information. So you have to determine uh, through these planning and, and discussions that you have around 911 or emergency service compliant compliance, uh, that has to be something that everybody's aware of. One of the last things I wanted to talk about was simply don't assume that the provider is going to support all this. And by provider, I mean the telephony provider. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, legacy PRI T1s out there, uh, E1s if you're you know, in Europe or wherever. Um, but a lot of uh, the legacy trunks, maybe they only support one location or maybe a very limited set of locations if it's a SIP trunk. Uh, maybe they only have a limited set of uh, locations that they'll support. Um, even so, many don't support uh, PIDF flow. That's the um, presence information data format location object. Yeah. That's basically the way Skype tells, tells uh, the 911 provider where it's located is by taking that address information that you provision through the PowerShell through these uh, set CSLIS commandlets and, in, and putting that in the SIP invite and sending that on. Many providers don't support that. So uh, you may need to consider either picking a, a new third party provider, maybe just only for emergency services, again, Red Sky or Entrado or, or somebody like that. Uh, level three here in the US supports that. Again, sorry, uh, US services. Or you need to consider uh, an ELIN gateway, ELIN being an uh, emergency location identification number, which is um, a phone number that is assigned to a specific location. So in the case of uh, ELIN, uh, the ELIN approach or having a gateway, uh, Skype would send the call to a gateway, and that could be a Sonus or an audio codes. Uh, it will take the phone number out of the uh, out of that PIDF flow, usually the company name uh, field is used for that, and it's going to do a call masking. So when the emergency services are called, they're going to see the phone number, the call that's coming from the that ELIN rather than the caller's original phone number. Uh, the reason they have that is just so they have the right location information. Uh, the reason you want to actually have a gateway to do that for you and not uh, and not just try to mask the call with Skype is if the call were to drop, the uh, emergency services will need to call back and you want that to go all the way back to the person who may sh initially made the call. You don't want uh, you don't want that just going to nowhere or being redirected to reception or something like that. You want to make sure that the person who made the call can get the call back. And these England gateways are intelligent about that. And they're usually not too expensive if it's an add-on for Sonus or audio codes. Uh, and beyond that, there's other niceties to them. Like uh, for example, if all circuits are busy, maybe there's a lot of 911 or emergency calls going through. Uh, you can have uh, actually cut a non-emergency call uh, to ensure that the emergency call does go through. So we can drop another connection. But with that, I just want to say thank you. Uh, hopefully this was valuable. And uh, hopefully it was, uh, if you were uh, somebody who was about to set up uh, emergency services for your firm or for another firm, uh, that, that you have really thought it through, that you have adjusted for the amount of time that this is going to take, that you are adequately prepared to discuss the costs associated with it and the complexities, uh, more so than just looking at the technical side of setting it up. Uh, and I want to thank Mark, uh, especially for having me on. Uh, I hope you all have a great day and or evening. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for that great session on Enhanced 911. And this concludes episode seven of the Skype Business Show. But before we go, details on our next episode. Episode 8 will air on Monday the 1st of August at 7pm British on the time. We have special guest Andrew Morpeth delivering a presentation on Clicks Call Flow Manager and also we have Josh Blaylock on from the Skype for B recap coming on to talk about hybrid. We look forward to seeing you on the next show. That's it from us. 
on this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.